And what we'll do first, I think you know most of it, most of us, but we'll go around and introduce ourselves so you're sure who you're talking to. <laughs> Marilyn, you want to start? Marilyn Garcia, editorial board member and columnist. Virginia General Staff. Mary Mitchell, editorial board member. Thomas Frisbee, editorial writer. I'm Tom McNamee, I'm the editorial page editor. Lorraine Fortam, editorial board member and editorial writer. Lee Bay, editorial board member, editorial writer. Okay. Well, listen, thanks again for coming in. Uh, here's what I want to do. Um, I think the reason there are four people in this race is because of the whole issue about that Jussie Smollett thing, right? Uh, my wife says it's Smollett. Um, so I do want to go right to that. There's no point in waiting for later, people waiting to talk about it. But it's really important to us that this conversation not be just about that. All right. It's real important we talk about the real issues of the state's attorney's office beyond one very high profile incident, which has brought a lot of attention to the uh, this. So more so than in some other meetings you've had recently, we're going to try to keep it contained. And if I seem a little strict about that, that's why we want to make sure we talk about a lot of other important issues. So we'll start by asking uh, Kim Fox, would you like to open up by talking about that? Uh, what do you want to say about the Jussie Smollett thing? And, and I guess the big question is, having seen what you said to the other papers editorial board is, um, why can't you just tell everything about what happened that day and not say that Dan Webb is doing an investigation? Yeah. So, one, thank you for having us all here. I appreciate the public's curiosity and actually concern about how this case was handled. As I've said uh, previously, you know, we dropped the ball in the level of transparency that we should have had around this case. Um, and immediately after this case was resolved, I said that I welcomed a non-political review of how our office handled the case. I called for back in April for the inspector general to come in and look at our office um, in the handling of that case from top to bottom. Uh, at that time in April, I said that I would not discuss what happened so that a review could happen. Um, that would be thorough and that the public could trust uh, the integrity of that review. Uh, during the course of uh, waiting for that review to happen, uh, Judge Tooman appointed a special prosecutor to this case, and Dan Webb was appointed back in, I believe, August. And so for the same reasons, making sure that the review of this case that the public um, wants, and they want to make sure that it is done at the utmost of integrity, not wanting to talk about the case, where there are witnesses who will be interviewed, whether there are people who will be talked to, that anything I say will influence how that case is uh, reviewed. And so that's why. I certainly understand the frustration and would echo uh, it is difficult even to be in this position and know uh, the facts and circumstances and be unable to talk about it until the review is done. But that's why. But at, at at the outset, uh, I want to say that our office has prided itself on being one of the most transparent prosecutor's offices in the country, um, putting every piece of felony case level data on an open data portal, availing ourselves uh, to people being able to see what we're doing, um, and receiving criticism for that. In this particular case, uh, we did not meet the standard of transparency that I hope this office to have achieved. Is it just transparency, or did you make other mistakes? Or you know, I think... The review will reveal ways that this office could improve, whether it's the process by which we handle uh, conflicts or recusal. Um, since that time, since this case has come into to be, we have hired a new ethics officer who has an extensive background working for the Attorney Registration and Discipline Commission, uh, clarified how we do recusals within the office. Um, and you know, there will be things, certainly, that we'll learn from this that we will hopefully do better by. So um, do you have any concerns about uh, the precedent that was set when uh, a person, and like Lex Smollett, who was accused of basically um, false, a false uh, reporting of a police matter, uh, don't you think that sets a precedent for other people who are in that situation to want to get off, not to be prosecuted, even if they lie to the police, even if they say, even if they set up uh, a bogus type of uh, uh, event, well, doesn't I, I set up the wrong precedent, which has nothing to do with transparency, yeah. but just the fact that he got off? I, I would disagree with that. We have cases of people filing false police reports um, 
before this case happened. In fact, there was a case, I believe that this paper reported on of a woman who said that she was attacked by a black man in Grant Park um, with a knife. Um, and it was widely reported, and it turned out, in fact, that that was a false police report. Um, in that particular case, the charges were not filed um, because it was apparent that this was someone who had some mental health issues and would better be dealt with outside of the court. Okay, but that's mental health issues. I mean, that, that doesn't come into play for this malaise. What I'm saying is, uh, Ms. Mitchell, to be clear, mm -hmm. the entirety of the case people aren't aware of. And every day we make decisions on these types of cases, cases that make the, the press and others that do not. I'm bringing an example to okay. match the question that you asked of, does this set a precedent? In fact, there was a case that happened at the same time with similar facts um, in which charges were not filed. And again, that's because our office has to look at each case based on the facts, the evidence, and the law, and the appropriateness of the disposition. Okay. Because why not why not have uh, Smollett plead guilty to something? Why was that on the table? Was that something your office could have done? Uh, again, I don't want to go into the specific specifics of this particular case, but our office has an array of dispositions that we can use um, as part of either diversion, alternative prosecution, or what we call uh, deferred prosecution, where in fact someone does not have to plead guilty in order to uh, avail themselves of that resource. I use, for example, it wasn't a case in our office, but another case that was widely reported on, uh, the case of Aaron Schock, who got a deferred prosecution. He was charged with 24 counts, I believe, um, that a case that had hung around for several years. Um, he didn't have to plead guilty. He had to do some conditions but like I, pay I, money I, back. or the like. That's the other folks, their reaction. Yeah. But just one more thought about sure. that. It's one thing to say you don't have to plead guilty. It's another thing to let a guy walk away who goes out and continues to say that, in fact, this happened and that the police treated him shabbily. I mean, it's really yeah, listen, not I, fair to the Chicago Cubs. I can't control what Mr. Smollett says or does. I absolutely cannot. Well, but you could have. You could have in that agreement. Actually, you could have said to him, we'll give you this deal. We'll let you walk. But you have to concede the fact that this is not true. Again, having not been a part of the discussions that happened with that case, and again, as it's being uh, reviewed, not wanting to go too far into it, I think the frustrations that the city has, and quite frankly, the people um, who worked on this case have, is the way that he handled this case after the case was resolved. And that frustration is real. However, as we look at our responsibility as prosecutors. We have to look at the facts, evidence, and law and find a disposition that we believe is appropriate. The reactions that come there from, um, I can't control. Okay. And Mr. Smollett's, I can't control So his. now let's ask the, your, uh, the other candidates right. to weigh in on this issue. We'll try to keep it tough. So um, <laughs> if, if I can, Tom. Um, let's be clear about one thing. This isn't a review that's being done. This is an investigation that is being done by a special prosecutor that could have severe consequences for Ms. Fox. So this isn't a review. Second thing is, why didn't, at the time the charges were dropped, why didn't she hold a press conference and say, look, two weeks ago we indicted Mr. Smollett on these 16 counts. Today we're dropping the charges and here's why. That could have happened before a special prosecutor got appointed, before there's hiding behind, you can't talk because a special prosecutor uh, has been appointed. If you pride yourself on transparency, you should have gotten up in front of the public and said, here's why I dropped the charges. And with a deferred prosecution, you do ask somebody to admit that they did wrong. You then require that they do community service, that they pay whatever restitution they need to pay. And then only after that do you agree that the charges are dropped. I don't think anybody here is arguing that Mr. Smollett should have done prison time here. But this was a case that for some unknown reason was indicted for 16 counts that everybody felt they could win, including the first assistant who said this was a winnable case. Ms. Fox herself said this was a winnable case. And then inexplicably, it's dropped without the public knowing why. And that's a problem. And that's what has to change. Okay. Bob? Well, first of all, uh, I'm not running because of Jesse Smollett. Uh, I was approached by several people. I asked them to uh, give me a certain amount of petitions within a month, and they did. 
They had 10,000 within the first month. We ended up filing, I think, 28,000. Uh, I wasn't organized. It was a grassroots um, uh, approach. Now, when we talk about Jesse Smollett, we can talk about the web approach. And it's, this is not to get so emotional about because a prosecutor has to approach it uh, with, a, with an understanding of what we're doing with the criminal justice system. Dan Webb's going to do what Dan Webb's going to do. But what, what do we know out of this? Well, a phone call started this whole thing early in the morning. Secondly, uh, we heard about a recusal. Uh, and either the state's attorney either misrepresented what a recusal is or she outright lied on what it is. And third, and Bill has a client, Jesse Smollett was treated differently from everybody else. I think we just heard some of the, the background. I mean, here's somebody indicted on 16 counts on March 8th. I'm, on, on March 26, everything's di uh, dismissed. The first assistant even says that day, hey, we, we could have convinced a trier of fact. Uh, the first assistant, uh, the uh, state's attorney herself said we could have done it with a trier of fact. It w we would have won that case. Uh, then all of a sudden, appearances before WBEZ by the state's attorney and in this paper and maybe before the, uh, this board, she said, well, there were some circumstances that pulled us back. Uh, it wasn't until, and then we look at April 16th on this treasure trove of emails that went back and forth where she had recused herself, but then she's scolding the first assistant as to uh, a comparison between this case and R. Kelly and over excessive and whether we did enough. I mean, We've got to get a handle here. And this is, a, this is an office that is important for social justice. It's important for everybody. And it shook the foundations of people believing in our legal system. And that's why I think when the pastors came to me and asked me to run, because they couldn't believe what they heard. And I know you had a column yesterday by one of your columnists who talked about, let's not talk about this case, because on the west and south side, they're not talking about it. Well, I think many of you know, I represented parts of the west and south side. I take the bus often to Austin uh, from the downtown. No, I don't get off at Austin because I get off of my stop. And I hear it all the time from people. And when I'm on the south and west sides, they talk about this case. This is not, it, it shook the foundations of people that believe in the criminal justice system, no matter how right or wrong, and we've seen a lot of wrong, but this case is the deciding case of this election, unfortunately. So, so would you all agree that this, in your view, this issue of how the office and how Kim Fox handled the Jesse Smollett case is a deal breaker? In your mind, in other words, there are so many other important issues in this office no, we should I discuss. No, I don't think it is. No, I, think I don't think it is either. One of no. the, I think it a shined factor. a light because a lot of people don't know what the state's attorney's office does. And so what this case did because of the celebrity involved is all of a sudden people actually read the articles about what the state's attorney's office does. But to me, the larger issues are violent crime, the okay. fact that we're not charging. Yeah. yeah, what, uh, you know, I could, I could talk about my client uh, for a long time, who even the judge said got unequal justice, and she today is still in a rigorous deferred, deferred prosecution. Um, but, you know, what I, what I also turn to is this newspaper's reporting about the pattern of behavior of politically connected uh, officials based on in Ms. Fox's tenure. And I really speak about uh, your paper's reporting about her relationship with Alderman Ed Burke. I mean, we know she ran as a reformer, but then immediately turned around and did the ultimate insider rite of passage of holding a fundraiser at Alderman Burke's home. And then shortly after she got in office, provided him with a, property, with a $2 million property tax rebate, the largest one given by her office in the first 11 months in, in, in office. And it's also worth noting, we're not just talking about some random funder here. We're talking about perhaps the most notorious uh, favor trader in the history of, of Chicago politics. And by the way, I cannot believe that she is still not giving back the money that was bundled for her by, by Alderman Burke at that, at that fundraiser, uh, as, as your paper has, has pointed out. And what I will say is I remember you all wrote an editorial saying, 
it is such a huge conflict of interest for the state's attorney to ta not take money from property tax appeal Can I lawyers. Ask you something? Please. If you don't have a, a billionaire father who gives you, in the most recent fine, another two and a half million dollars for your case, and that's where all your money's coming from, from your dad and his friends, then you have to take money from somewhere else. And if you start taking money from somewhere else, how carefully do you have to vet every single person? I mean, Ed, this thing about Ed Burke goes back quite a few years now. I, yeah. I don't think anybody would take money from Ed Burke now. Back then, it was rather common. And if you're not, a, if, and if you're not the son of a, a very wealthy man who's funding your campaign, what's your alternative? It is worth noting that, that President Preckwinkle and other mayoral candidates gave that money back, despite, uh, despite that goes. But I haven't been shy about the fact that my family is going to put significant resources in there, because we all know for too long in this town, the entrenched political machine puts people in power. And when those people are in power, they think they owe something to that machine. And that is a consistent issue. But there are plenty of politicians who, who have run for office in this city, county, state, uh, who, who have done so uh, without taking money that provides an obvious conflict of interest. And I was one, I gave back over $100,000 to developers in my first year. And don't forget, when Tony Preckwinkle and Ed had that fundraiser at Ed Burke's house, and they raised over $116,000. It was used to defeat me, and the Democratic Party has always, always doubled and tripled their resources to try to defeat me. Okay, Not to be late with the point, but Mr. Conway, you did yeah. bring this up. Could you explain what's the, what was the difference really between the Candace Clark case yeah. and the Jesse Smollett case? Because okay. that's, a, that's a commercial sure. that is very well, I, I think, disturbing. I think we start with the fact that, you know, Ms. Clark still has a case that is pending and her lawyer choosing to exploit that for his political gain is his choosing. I would also point out that Mr. Conway um, acknowledged that Ms. Clark had a case that was pending in court that he read about in the newspaper and then reached out and asked to have her public defender who was representing her in this case removed so that he could represent her, despite the fact that he had not represented anybody in criminal court since he left the state's attorney's office is over six years ago. He chased a client, represented her so that he could then put her into a commercial. Mm -hmm. I find that to be utterly appalling. Out of respect for Ms. Clark, um, not the respect that she's been given by her lawyer, I cannot talk about the Excuse me? circumstances. Not the respect that she's been but given by her difference? attorney? I'm just trying to get to the difference. The difference is that there were circumstances before Ms. Clark was actually charged that could have had this case handled outside of the criminal justice system. And because those factors were not done, the case was then brought into the justice system. And again, that's information that is not publicly available that perhaps in the next series of commercials, Mr. Conway will exploit. But are, are you saying that there are circumstances that that would dictate that she could, her case could be over now, but are you yes. trying to say that? I'm saying her case could have not you, come into the system at all. But if that's the case, then that kind of tells me that her case isn't worth prosecuting and why, why not drop it? Because the case could have been resolved before it ever came into a courtroom. And there was an actual victim in that case um, where the resolution was sought before the case was filed in court. Because it wasn't resolved by Ms. Clark, the case was then filed so that we could get to resolution I, 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 without I see, her I see Donna case. nodding her head on this very issue. So I'm real the, curious to know what you well, have no, to say. The, the other interesting thing about the case, if you read the transcript, is that the judge was basically, in my opinion, asking the defense to try this case. So it, in a bench trial that might have given a not guilty altogether. When you read that transcript, it's pretty clear. But Mr. Conway, because he doesn't have a lot of trial experience, elected to plead out the case. And I find it a little bit interesting that he's talking about insider politics and a Burke contribution when his family company, the Carlisle Group, if you follow the money, as Mr. Conway says we should, we follow the money to the master of pay to play, which is the which is the Carlisle Group. They came into Illinois. They paid the likes of Tony Resco and Bill Cellini to get what they wanted, which were pension funds to invest. And then they got kicked out of Illinois. So when we're talking about insider politics, let's just make sure we understand that it's it's a little hard coming from Mr. Conway. Bill, yes. All right. A few things to respond to there. I I begged the state's attorney's office for the Jussie Smollett special. Believe me, begged them to get it. 
which he gave about five minutes of a TV episode and got credit for 16 hours of community service that he's already done. And not to mention, it's worth noting, my client was never charged with theft. I do want to say there was kind of a little bit of an implication, implication there, but she's involved in a very rigorous program where we go to court every month even now. Uh, she has to maintain a job. If she doesn't maintain that job, she has to do 96 hours of community service. She visits her probation officer regularly. She has to be enrolled in GED classes. If she wants to leave Cook County, we have to go get permission from a judge to do that. And that's not right. And actually, Ms. Clark actually heard uh, some of the statements said by, by Ms. Fox about politicizing this case uh, before the Daily Herald. She was very upset by it. And I actually have a statement from her that I will share share with you all at the end of this as well. I know, the, we have and I believe we have the original well. statement from her immediately after this case was publicized, where she said she did not wish to be compared to Jesse Smollett, that she did not wish um, to be made example of, and it was published, I believe, in this paper. So, so the fact do, that she's changed her mind now. It, so, given all that, how do how how would you improve? And this anybody can answer this question. How would you improve the relationship? between Chicago Police Department, which this this Follett case was national, and you had the police superintendent, you know, saying very bad things, and you had you had people really kind of upset. So how do you how do you improve the relationship between the Chicago Police Department and the state's attorney's office given everything that has happened? And just I would like each of you to, yeah. to answer that. First of all, I also did represent when I left the state's attorney's office, I did represent represent some folks after that for okay. for whatever that's worth. Um, but also when we talk about the, uh, the, the, um, the police, you know, I had the opportunity and I was in the state's attorney's office to work with hundreds, if not thousands of wonderful police officers, people who, um, you know, stayed up, stayed up all night, several days in a row to, to, you know, find, find the perpetrator of a crime, people that cried with victims after their shift. And I think it's important that we know that, uh, those law abiding police officers are people that are, are supported by the state's attorney's office. And by the same token, I prosecuted three police officers, people that were not law-abiding. And I think it's important that people know that, uh, that the state's attorney's office will not be afraid to come after non-law-abiding police officers too. In fact, in an especially egregious case I had, the, f the first one I had to prosecute. But, but how do you improve the relationship? There's a strain, there's a tension now that, that exists between police department and it's the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. How, how do you- Well, I think the messaging, something else also is that um, you know, back when I was in the office, the state's attorney's office was um, heavily involved in training of police officers. And I think there's two kinds of bad police officers. One are ones that are bad, non-law abiding police officers. Not, they're not in the job for the right reasons. And those folks, we need to get them out of the police department, criminally prosecute or not. But there's also ones that don't recognize their constitutional limitations. And that's where I think the state's attorney being heavily involved in the training of these officers can be very helpful. And it's probably more important for the suburban police departments than it is even for the, Mary, for the city may. ones. I mean, yeah. I think uh, yeah, the, let's the presumption, the other end yeah, the, the presumption the that the relationship has been strained, I, this case garnered a lot of attention. There was, uh, at the time, the superintendent, the former mayor, talking about this case on national television and the like. Um, and immediately thereafter, the superintendent and I continued to work well, every case that comes through the state's attorney's office has a police officer attached to it, whether it's CPD or suburban. They are a witness on every single case that we have. Um, despite the theatrics that happened around this case, the hardworking men and women of CPD and the state's attorney's office continue to work together to uh, prosecute and build strong cases. I think what we saw in the aftermath, again, was uh, political histrionics by some of the leadership of the Fraternal Order of Police who are not representative of the men and women who are on the ground working these cases. And so what we've done is what we've always done. We have worked with them to increase their training. We pre put together the first of its kind felony review guidebook. We went and did roll call trainings on Fourth Amendment issues. We continue to help build capacity with them. And during the month of April, for example, when this was at the height of its media scrutiny, Chicago police officers and our attorneys worked uh, to a successful prosecution of 10 first degree murder cases. The work of the police and the prosecutor's office never stopped, despite some of the histrionics that we saw from the beginning. 
And the way that we continue to do that, one, is to remove that from our conversation, realize that we're partners in this work, realize that the people who live in neighborhoods that are impacted by violence don't want to see prosecutors or police pointing fingers at each other. And I want to be clear, in all of my dealings, since I've been in this office, I haven't done that. And I've been the subject of, and, and you know this, uh, attacks that have come from FOP leadership about cases that we've charged or not charged based on the facts, the ev uh, evidence, and the law. But we have to always maintain a level of professionalism because that's what's expected by the people in the community. Yes. I think it revolves around respect and communication both ways. I'm the only candidate that has actually charged and tried murders, rapes, and armed robberies. So I have worked with the police from the beginning of a case all the way through to a verdict. So as a leader of the state's attorney's office, I walk in with a level of respect from the police department. I also agree that we have to have better training, joint training, but nobody's above the law. And, and even with a partnership between prosecutors and the police, you still have to you still have to make the tough calls. And I think here, the, the police, both city and suburban, rank and file, their frustration has been that we can't get charges out of the state's attorney's office, or we can get undercharging, that a, a rape is charged as a residential burglary. So I think both sides need to sit at a table, because we're not going to solve anything unless we actually talk to each other, amazingly enough. And we have to understand. What do the police need from us as prosecutors that they don't feel they're getting? I may agree well, or disagree well, with well, them. Well, what do you think this state, you just said it's mm -hmm. about policy. It's about the state attorney's right. office policies that the police take exception to. Yes. What policies of the state attorney's office do you think contribute to that problem and need to be changed? I want to interrupt for a moment. They had a press conference where they laid out the policies. They said it themselves. They named three things. They didn't like that we weren't prosecuting marijuana cases. They didn't like that we were not prosecuting what we call 6303s, cases in which we were prosecuting people for driving on suspended licenses because of their inability to pay their tickets. And they didn't like what we were doing with bail reform. On marijuana, marijuana is now legal, and we vacated the conviction and retail theft, and we vacated convictions. On the 6303s, uh, the city of Chicago stopped suspending licenses because of people's inability to pay tickets. And just last month, Governor Pritzker signed the License to Drive Act, where he's returning 55,000 driver's licenses to folks. They made it clear. They laid out the specific policy agenda. Well, now, what it relates to retail theft, they continue to be frustrated by the position of this office to raise the felony threshold of retail theft. And as I said, everywhere I go, in 2016, the bloodiest year we had in almost 20 years in this city, the state's attorney's resources were not going to guns and violence. They were going to retail theft. And not that these cases aren't being prosecuted. They are being prosecuted as misdemeanors. But the reality is that we were spending more resources going after low-level offenses than violent crimes. But isn't okay. there, let me, let, let me, let me I, want, okay. I want to piggyback on that because that's the question I had is about retail theft because um, we ran into that where um, you're not prosecuting unless people like have have ten priors and it's a thousand dollars and yeah. doesn't that set a bad precedent that people can repeatedly yeah. shoplift? People you know, are repeatedly so let, shoplifting. So let's be clear. Part of the reason, and again, where I start with where we use our prosecutorial resources, everywhere in the country, save for forty-seven states, have a higher felony threshold than Illinois. Everyone. We also, the reason we put our data publicly is when we looked at when these cases come into court, almost half of them were being dismissed on the first court date because retailers weren't coming to court when we charged them as felonies. And so what we were seeing, and again, I think that we have to be very careful of not just using antidote, but using fact, what we were seeing is we were charging these cases. And what would happen is the cases were being dismissed because the retailer got their merchandise back, they don't want the person back in their store, and they weren't coming to court. But if they're not prosecuted at all they in any way, but then, but what you're saying- Is they're prosecuted as misdemeanors, let, correct. Okay, but a misdemeanor, they people are not necessarily getting their stuff back. I mean, we've I, had retailers say that their thefts are up like 60%. What I will tell you is that we can't even charge a retail theft case unless the retailer has their stuff back. 
That is a piece well, of the I, evidence I, that I, I, I would I like to address my Rachel, Rachel, Rachel Hinton has a follow-up here. Oh, she needs to get it. And, but yes, could I address the, uh, the Mary's question for one moment? What do you see Rachel. people worry? Rachel. What do you see people worry? First of all, there were a couple of statements that were made throughout the course of this right now. One of them about the histrionics of the FOP. The fact of the matter is virtually every police chief in the county uh, said, uh, had a vote of no confidence on what was happening here. Uh, and so it's not just uh, FOP. But how do you restore the trust? I'm going to do the same things that I did as uh, alderman. I'm going to make sure that we have strong backing of law enforcement, but at the same time we provide the resources. We can talk about all this training stuff, but I don't think anybody's ever gone to the training academy here. And, and listen, I mean, I we should have. say, except yes. for Ms. Fox, Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, and, and listen to what is said at the training academy on how they are, are told about all, what, what is constitutionally permissible. And, and the other thing, I keep hearing uh, from one of the candidates that uh, bad police officers. Well, you know what? There's bad lawyers. There's bad this. There's bad that. Police officers are the first responders on the scene. And I recently looked at, and a, a pastor showed me something that happened during the summer when he arrived on a scene of a kid uh, who was bleeding throughout the street. You know what? The overarching uh, concern of police officers is difficult. Let me ask you this. The, the, the question is the relationship between the police and the state's attorney's office. You're pointing out the, that it has to do with training, has people appreciate police. My question is this. This is not a new issue and didn't begin with the election of right. the current incumbent state's attorney. These, this conflict between the police, these tensions, go quite a while back. They go back before Laquan McDonald. So what we're trying to understand, because this, the election's coming up, is to what extent this has to do with current decisions, policies, and actions of this state's attorney's office. Well, Tom, first I of all, but, but, I but, some, I but some of it, okay. Uh, I spent part of the day yesterday. Uh, I serve on the Illinois State Bar, Bench and Bar uh, Committee. I've, I've given seminars on what to do in, our, in the profession of law. But we also, I, I, we, we look and analyze case uh, bills that are going through the legislature. I did it on Monday on several, and yesterday on a whole host of other ones that are going through that deal with the exact issues. See, there's confusion when the state's attorney sets their own policy beyond the scope of what the law is, it creates this let me, confusion. Let me ask, yes. let me ask Bill and Don the same question. It, it, there's always historically been this tension, at least in recent history. If you go back to the 60s, there was no tension because they were working on the same side of the fence at all times. Uh, Bill, we'll start with you first. To what extent is this tension between... Are we going to get to Rachel's question time? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, excuse me. To all what right. extent be, is this tension between the police department and the state attorney's office something new, something that has grown because of the incumbent, because of Kim Fox's actions and her policies and her office's policies? And to what extent are we just pointing to something that's historically been there for a long time? Well, you have heard, I mean, I've many, many friends who are police officers and they, and they talk about the difficulty in, in getting, getting charges approved, uh, you know, on, on cases. Is that new? Uh, it's grown in volume, I would say, in that. Yes, it is new. It's, no, it's, so I mean, there's, there's always there's, been felonies well, that weren't approved. Hold on approved. a minute, Bob. Yeah. You know, g given that you were never in felony review, well, there's a tension in felony I review. I felony cases, so don't. As a prosecutor? It, given felony review, which is where the charges happen, there is a tension. Sometimes they bring you a case and you're like, sorry, I don't have the evidence to charge this case. But the problem is, is that there seems to be a systematic non-charging here. So what's happening with retail theft is that the retail thefts aren't being charged, so now we're getting armed robberies because organized gangs, this isn't a one-off guy coming in to steal a candy bar or a coat. These are organized gangs coming in, sometimes at the same exact time every week, to steal stuff so they can then sell it and buy drugs and guns. I, and that's what we have I to wanted, focus on. They're I, taking in, they're now becoming armed robberies, they're taking in 10-year-olds as shields, and that's what happens when you announce 
you need to that have. That you're not going to prosecute I wanna, whole categories of crime. And if the, if the retail theft level is too low, then let's go to the legislature and work with the legislature to make the change. But where you use your prosecutorial discretion is when you get that case and you look at the person in your courtroom or at felony review and you say, okay, they're in school, they're trying to get out of a gang, they have a parent that's interested in what they're doing. That's how you make a, dis a discretionary decision. Ms. Fox, what do you say to people yeah. who worry that you're putting too much emphasis or, or focus on the reform part of things yeah. and not public safety? Thank you. I, I say that you have to work on reform in order to achieve public safety. I want to, in, in answering that, it answers a couple of things that have been said. Uh, I remind folks that the history of this county is that we had a significant number of wrongful convictions, that we were once dubbed the false confession capital of the United States. When I came in the office, part of the reason that we were looking at our data, the first time in any prosecutor's office in the country that we've made our data available. And we were looking at public safety. That's why I said when we had the bloodiest year in 20 years and our resources weren't going after public safety. Um, when we were looking at gun cases, the reality was is that we were losing a significant number of gun cases, losing them. And part of that was I was in felony review. I was a supervisor. We were charging every case that came in. I used as an example, there'd be four people in a car. They'd pull the car over and they'd find a gun in it. Now, what would happen in the past is that we would accept the case where they charge every single person for possessing one gun. That is not how you prosecute cases. So then what would happen is that you would have four people who are found not guilty. Or maybe one person would plead even though it wasn't theirs because they were sitting in jail because they couldn't afford bond and needed to get out. And the ability for us to look at our data and see that yes, in fact, we were prosecuting a lot of cases or charging a lot of cases. And out of fear of saying, I'm not gonna charge a bad case, would kick it down the road. But there were human consequences to that. There were actual people who were in jails for crimes that shouldn't have been charged in the first time. So we are discerning. We are looking at the facts and the evidence. And we are doing things like reform on bail, on poverty, so that people who need to trust the system or the Watts cases well, feel comfortable coming forward because they believe the system is fair, because we need those people in the neighborhoods to be able to trust the work. Governor, so what, do you then, what do you then do with a no, case? What do you then do with that hypothetical case? Do you just and let it go? Or what, so what, what, what would happen, happen in now? the past? And, and that's why I said we have to be very clear. We have to be very clear where we were in the system. Somehow the memory of some of my opponents here about this rosy days of prosecution in the state's attorney's office that they want to go back to was a time period where we were charging anybody and everybody and hoping that they would get shaken out. Now what we say is we can't charge that case. We're glad that we got the gun off the street because that's important, but we can't charge four people for possessing one gun. So then let's put a manual together to talk about how we look at these cases. Let's do roll call training to go over Fourth Amendment issues. Let's look at the data. We started sitting with CPD on a monthly basis and going over all of our gun stats, and that's how we've been able to improve. But there was no communication, right? The state's attorney's office would charge, or the police arrest, state's attorney's office would charge, and then whatever happened to the case, there was no coming together to say how we could do better as a, as a system. So, you know, picking up on the... Uh, Pick, picking up on that uh, public safety issue, violent crime has been down over the past few years. Um, you, you, in your campaign material, you, you, you take a bit of credit for that. Um, why? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, for the rest of you, um, you know, is that, is that, is that proper? Well, I, I, we take... Why and how? I well, one, ask. I think we took an innovative approach. What we said was, let's, again, for the charging decisions that come, have prosecutors on the ground in our most violent neighborhoods. We were able to do that by releasing some of the resources that we were going after nonviolent, low-level offenses. To get to Rachel's point, if we were doing less of the retail thefts, we could then dedicate more resources to guns. So we created the first of its kind, Gun Crime Strategies Unit, here in the city, where we took lawyers out of the court 
courtroom and put them in our most violent plague neighborhoods. We started in Inglewood and Lawndale, and we worked with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the ATF, the police commanders, and said, who are the drivers of violence in these communities, and how do we target our resources to going after those drivers? We then were successful there that we moved to five other police districts. Former Mayor Rahm Emanuel asked, is there a way that you can have more people brought? Lori Lightfoot and I have had ongoing conversations about how we can have more attorneys. When the review of the Chicago Police Department came out from PERF a couple months ago, looking at the low homicide clearance rate, one of the recommendations that they made was that they have more prosecutors in the districts. We were there. The University of Chicago did a study, an independent study, that found that where we had our prosecutors in the Gun Crime Strategies Unit, we saw a higher uh, or lower uh, uh, reduction in violent crime. Now, we don't take full credit for that. We can't. Violent crime, um, which is why I don't like fear mongering, so, um, is sometimes I, inexplicable. So I've got to keep so, moving this. That, certainly. Uh, Lee's question is a really good one, which is to what extent can the state attorney's office take credit for what is really going on, which is well, crime rate, violent crime rate in this city has been going down during the last well, four years. No, first but of not all, in the well, city's yeah. most yeah. violent Excuse neighborhood. So, so let's, up a and, 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 and the uh, Kim Fox just gave her explanation for that. We'll start with Donna, we'll go straight down the line. Do they get credit? Well, first of all, in our toughest neighborhoods, last year, violent crime was up by a third. In January this past month, it was up by 42% shootings. So, you know, it has to be a partnership to affect violent crime. And where there was overcharging in the, the past. The reality is, can I interrupt you, Donna? The reality yeah. is, and you, you say certain neighborhoods that has not gone down or not as much, Citywide, violent crime rates have consistently been going down for the last four years. Who gets credit? Not the state's attorney's office? I think the, the, the main credit goes to our first responders and the police who have beefed up crime in certain uh, police uh, presence in certain of our most dangerous neighborhoods. And the state's attorney's office, the police has cleared cases and the state's attorney has in charge 50% of those murders. So it is, sorry, when you're- she, She's uh, shaking her head like you're yeah, saying. Yeah, those, those, those are the- the fear. The problem is Hit when we get to just- Why I love having our data on an open data portal. Why I, I, data is so important. Mm -hmm. And policy, you know, we can't have policy by soundbite. Like this is, it's inappropriate, particularly for this office, to shout out numbers that we cannot substantiate. This office continues to look at cases and charge them where appropriate. The number that she has pulled from I don't know where, about 50%, is inaccurate. It's absolutely false. Well, we well, have, so let's ask we, you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It's, it's a very simple question. Crime rates have been going down, violent crime Nationally, rates. Nationally, they have. To what extent does the state attorney's office policies, actions, do they get I think very that? limited. Why? Uh, I, I think it is the, the first responders who are on the scene, who make the cases and do what needs to be done. I've heard about the false confession and a couple other uh, uh, interviews here uh, from the state's attorney. And the fact of the matter is in 2013 and 2014, the legislature, and I, I keep going back to the real policy makers, uh, introduced and passed legislation dealing with uh, eyewitnesses and how we treat eyewitnesses. And at the same time, when and how we record certain uh, crimes. And that all helped uh, uh, deal with the false confession. You know, uh, again, I'm going back the uh, Governor Pritzker the other day said, uh, as he referenced the uh, Sentencing and Criminal Justice um, Commission uh, and looking at all of those acts. Right now, I'm being deluged with uh, several, with 40 or 50 um, judges and attorneys from around the state as we look at some of the uh, legislation that's being introduced uh, and setting the right kind of policy. And we are doing it from plaintiffs and defendants, uh, state's attorneys who are all involved in making recommendations on the acts. Now, nationally, the crime rate has gone down. But uh, in the city of Chicago, it's gone slower. And, you know, if the state's attorney's office is going to take credit for that going down, I, that then could, why Bob, is it Bob, why I don't is think that's actually accurate. I think nationally, the rate of the reduction in violent crime has gone down at a slower rate than it has in Chicago in recent years. No, I think it's the other way around. But I could be way, wrong, too. Either way, yeah. uh, it's going down. And, but 
will the state's attorney's office then take uh, credit for it going up as it did last month? And the numbers in both the shootings, uh, 33%, or the murder rate that's gone okay. up 45%. So, Bill, you want to answer the same I question? Do. I do. So, Tom, you know, we all know that uh, 2016 was a very bloody year. But, uh, you know, a couple other numbers to talk about is that there were 492 murders here last year versus 254 in Los Angeles and 318 in New York, obviously much larger cities. But we only had 470 murders in 2015. So it appears that 2016, in light of what happened, was the outlier year. And it's also worth noting that the Chicago Police Department seized 10,000 illegal guns last year, far more than they were seizing, more than any police department in any city in America, but also far more than, were received, than, than the roughly 7,000 they, they seized in 2015. But I am, I am passionate that when someone is, commits a crime with a gun, I think that person should stay in jail. And because I fundamentally believe that more guns on the street is not a good thing. That's a bad thing. But if we're what really going to get after this, we need to get after the what supply you, so chain what that you brings get four all four guys in a car and one gun? That's, that's a case you can't prove. And, I, and I'm saying that as someone that was in misdemeanor court in, in 2006, 2007, 2008. I had plenty of retail thefts that were over $300 that were misdemeanors. I saw plenty in traffic. I saw plenty of 6303 it's driving on a suspended license that could have been charged at the felony level. So I actually do believe, believe in pure discretion when it, comes to, when it comes to retail theft. But getting back to guns, if we are going to get after the gun crime epidemic that we have here, we need to get after the supply chain that brings all these guns here. And I look back on my military experience when I said that. My, my job over in, in Qatar and Afghanistan was figuring out where does the Taliban get its money from so that we could attack those money sources so they couldn't buy weapons to attack us. And we had to work our way up a very complicated supply chain that did not involve a banking system to do that. And we need to bring that same style of intelligent thinking to getting after the supply chain that brings all these guns here. Okay. You know, I just want to, if I could, I want to get back briefly, very briefly to the, to the murder, 50% um, uh, of murders not being charged. I just want to get a little more clarity on that. Are you saying not charged at all, undercharged? What, what do you think is going, is so, going on? And, and Kim, if you could sure. chime in. So uh, based on the police are saying that they're clearing, this was in, I think, a WGN report about you have a 50-50 chance of getting away with murder. So the police are clearing cases because they know who did it, and 50% of the cases they are clearing are not being charged. And so, again, as running for the top prosecutor, we realize that we have to have all the facts and not look at news clips to believe that that is the accuracy of, of the data. Uh, what I believe they were saying, one, there's the cases that have not been solved. Uh, we have a low homicide clearance rate. And just for a moment to go back to the question that was asked earlier about what people are talking about, they are and have concerns about Smollett, I hear every day from murder victims' families about the low homicide clearance rate and the wish, the wish that we spent more time talking about the loss and the trauma that they're suffering from. What that was about was when cases were being brought to our office that they believed that they had cleared and closed, our ability to say, in fact, that that is the person that we are able to prove those charges. As Mr. Conway said, they, we, you can have four people in the car and say, I, we believe it's them, let's close the case. We still can't prove it. And so what we have been able to do is be able to discern and say when we can't prove a case, not to charge it. And that is fundamentally important because we have had people in this county in prison for decades for crimes that they didn't commit. And I don't think we can be dismissive of that for every wrongful conviction that we vacate. And I want to go back to false confession capital to leading the country over the last two years in vacating wrongful convictions. We have to get it right. We have to make sure that we are charging cases appropriately and not kicking it down the line and hoping that someone else fixes it. And that's what was happening in this county previously. So and why when you charged 16 counts did you drop it with no explanation? I'm, what was wrong? You had the evidence to charge. What I want to be clear to, I'm not going to speak to the specifics of that case, but I do want to talk about the practice of overcharging in prosecutors' offices, where I want to make sure that our office, and we've been working on this for the last three years, are not putting people in a position of charging cases so that we can get an easier disposition based on the number. We run out of time, and I want to make sure we get everybody in on this reform. conversation. I just do one more question. Yeah. 
while we can appreciate criminal justice and the need for criminal justice reform, I think there's a lot of debate over what is constitutes a violent crime. And mm -hmm. when you say that there's a gun and four people in a car and then they all walk away, that seems to me to say that's not a violent crime. What, what in it's, your it's, mind, it's, what would be a violent crime? Why, why not, is not an illegal gun? Possession I'm, of a legal gun on the street, why is that not considered a violent Mary, crime? Mary, I'm not saying it's not a violent crime. What I'm saying, when you can't charge someone because you don't have the evidence to prove it, you can't charge someone. That's not an indictment or an indication on the, the violence level of the offense. It's that we can't be in the habit because out of fear, doing something that the law doesn't allow us to do. And so in our, in, in our office, we take all of it seriously. We do recognize that gun violence is a, a scourge and has cost many lives. And that's why we've been focused on, in our gun crime strategies unit, building up those cases appropriately, charging cases appropriately, and getting successful convictions as a result of that. That's what keeps communities safe. So Bill, you yeah. specifically make the point, going to Mary's question, yeah. that you think you got to really make sure people who are gun offenders don't walk. The implication is that the current state attorney is allowing people who are uh, engage in gun crimes to walk free. Can you give one example of how that works and how you would change it? Yeah, I sure can. Um, so, you know, under the Bail Reform Act, there are uh, a series of, of um, the way the Bail Reform Act is laid out. There are some charges that are mandatory no bail, like murder. Uh, there are some where there is presumption that they won't have to pay of meaning no bail, they won't be given, yeah. they'll be given an I-bond. Uh, but also, there is a series of charges that are discretionary, uh, discretionary no bail, but they require the state's attorney to file a petition. Cases like uh, armed habitual criminal or uh, gun possession by a felon, possession of a machine gun, for example. Until very recently, the state's attorney's office was not filing any of these petitions when they needed to be filed, and only recently started doing them in earnest when the appellate court said they had to in a recent case that came down in, in People v. Gill. So I can promise you that in these cases that we will be filing these petitions and advocating strongly that, that these folks uh, be held. And because if we're gonna get after the gun crime epidemic, I talked about the supply side of guns, but we also have to deal with the demand side of guns. And when you have cases like somebody walking down the street with an AK-47 and then they're out, out on bond the very next day, that just sends a wrong message to folks in the community. And that's why I am I am passionate about this subject. Mr. Conway has left out that the state's attorney does not make bail decisions. The bail decision is made by a judge. And he is absolutely right. We make recommendations, we put together packets, and in fact, we have, and our data shows it, filed more armed habitual criminal cases involving people in possession of guns, felon in possession of guns, than in the previous administration in the last three years. Um, but the notion, again, that Mr. Conway is going to impose bail, when that is singularly under the purview of the judge in the courtroom, um, is inaccurate. It's false. And he knows that. I think but in, they have in terms to file the petition. Bail, they have to file the petition. They're not doing it. In terms of bail, what's happening, and this has been reported when they did uh, uh, a big expose on domestic violence issues, the state's attorney has to advocate. That's, that's the job of a prosecutor is to be an advocate. And what, what's happening is we're not advocating to keep violent offenders in jail pretrial. So you have an abuser who gets back out and re-abuses his victim in domestic violence, sometimes two, three, and four times before they're kept in. You have uh, somebody charged with criminal sexual assault, a rapist who gets out and, re and rapes somebody else. So the problem is, is you have to, look, I think that what we need is a balance. I think that's what everybody's looking for in Cook County. You don't want to overcharge. You don't want to needlessly charge. You don't want to criminalize poverty. But you don't want to put public safety at risk. And where we need to be is a better balance. Well, uh, yeah. the, the, uh, several of you have talked about, and you talked about, and you just talked about it, people walking free and then reoffending and petitions not being filed. Is there data evidence to show that this has happened? It's being reported yes. in the newspaper. There, oh, is, actually, right. there, is, but there, is, there is actual data and evidence right. that is being chosen not to be spoken about. And again, 
it is disingenuous for folks to sit here knowing that there is in fact a treasure trove of data that they can put together to make the point to simply cite to a news report that they read. I point to a WGN investigate story that says that 12% of gun offenders uh, are then again caught with an illegal gun. That's, I mean, that's what I would point to. In that okay, and so, uh, I mean, the question is, uh, those that are caught with a gun uh, and when they're convicted should have, uh, ha there should be severe penalties. I think, look what happened in New York. You're talking about New York and the murder rate going down there. Remember the football player who had a gun, shot himself in the foot, and how many years did he serve? Maybe it's time, and again, I go back to what's happening down in Springfield because, we, yes, we do have to advocate for the bond. That's our role. That is the role of the state's attorney before the cases. I mean, uh, you know, the state's attorney knows that uh, there was a party, uh, 150 people the other day, all streaming live, doing a video of some sort, 25, 35, uh, 25, 30 guns that were taken at that. A fight, also the fight that broke out with the first responders. Four people, only four were arrested. Uh, three of them were let out on uh, I bonds. Uh, but with uh, some home monitoring. And at the same time, one was given a $5,000, uh, which translates to a $500 cash bond. We have to be clear on who we charge and how we do it. Let's face facts. We shouldn't be getting so emotional on this, these issues, because, but the people are emotional. I understand that. And retail theft, if, they, if something happens at their shop, they catch the people, but I've talked to them. I've even seen it at a Walgreens near my house where the, the cashier uh, yelled, there he goes again. And when I got up to, to ask her, and she was African-American, she said, this guy steals from us almost every day. Uh, you know, we can't, uh, it, it's, it, we have to have a balance here, but the balance is not that the state's attorney makes policy, it's the legislature that makes the policy. And this discussion that's going to happen in Springfield on all of these bills, and if these two wanna chime in, jo join <laughs> us on the Illinois State Bar, join the C uh, Chicago Bar Association, join the American Bar Association, where I have been active in all these, and we can make decisions collectively with judges, prosecutors, state's attorneys, and regular citizens to see what we need here in the state of Illinois. I'm very proud of the fact that we've been able to do just that, that we, in trying to reform the system, using our prosecutorial discretion with the issues that we have here. You talk about New York and LA having a much lower homicide uh, rate than we do in Chicago. That's absolutely right. They targeted going after violent crime. They also have a much higher felony retail theft threshold than we do here, $1,000 respectively in each of those jurisdictions. They're able to then be able to go after violence. Uh, but I am proud of the fact, Bob, that we did stop the prosecuting the driving on a suspended license because of people's inability to pay, that the city changed their I've policy and ultimately the state changed their policy. I am proud of the fact that we stopped prosecuting marijuana offenses and said that we were going to vacate those. And the that city we were passed able the legislation to, for it. I and agree. that the, the state, state passed it and baked no, that in. And so before. we have been able to use our discretion and go after violent crime and change policy. I believe you can do both. And to Rachel's point earlier, I believe you have to do both. If you have people who live in Ida B. Wells, and know that a Sergeant Watts was shaking people down, and you have such a distrust in the criminal justice system, and your children have it because they've seen this happen, if you don't do anything about that, if you don't vacate those convictions, if you don't acknowledge the harms that have been caused, in those neighborhoods where violence permeates, they're not picking up the phone to call us. Part of the issue that we have is we have a lot of street justice because people don't trust the system, not just police officers, but prosecutors. When you're locking someone up for a low level offense and you know they can't afford a bond and you're recommending that someone basically get, you know, no bond by giving a homeless person a $2,000 bond, they don't trust us. And so you, it, they're, they're, the balance isn't like one or the other, it's you have to do both at the same time, and particularly in a county like Cook that has had such a fraught relationship with communities that have been impacted by violence because of the failures of this criminal justice system. And what you system. just said is I, each case is different and each case has to be evaluated accordingly. But, 
on that point, how do you, I guess the three of you, and maybe Ms. Fox as well, how do you make sure that you're putting the right people in jail, that you are kind of hitting that balance and making sure that the community does trust you, but you are going after those cases, but also, I mean, watching that jail population, making sure that people that you put in jail have the means to get out or that you're aware of all those things. I guess, how do you hit that balance? We you, have to you, fundamentally you, remember, you wanna go first? All right. that's, okay. All right, you know, we need to remember that jail, <laughs> jail is a place for people that are, are a danger to the community. It's not a place to put people there because they're poor. It's not a place that you sh we shouldn't be putting people there because they're addicted and we shouldn't be putting people there who are mentally ill if they're, not, if they're not a danger to the community. And that's what we need to remember. But if somebody commits a violent crime, somebody commits a crime with a gun, I think that person should go to jail. And everywhere I, everywhere I say that in this county, people seem to agree, but yet it's, but yet it's not happening. And that's where I draw the, and that's where I draw. But the what was happening, Bill, that. is that in the back in the day that you keep referencing to, that's exactly what we were doing. That we had a jail population that required a federal monitor for four decades, four decades. When, when, when Donna was in the office, when Bill was in the office, we were in fact holding people in jail who were not a threat to public safety, who were addicted, who were mentally ill, and there was silence related to it. It is now in vogue to talk about making sure that we have the right people in the jail, but it is not by accident, but with intentionality that in the last several years, we've said just that, people who are a threat. I remind people, Jason Van Dyke was charged with first degree murder, but was able to bond out with $100,000. There was another police officer we charged with first degree murder who was bond it out. Um, the dangerous people should not be able to pay their way out while poor nonviolent people have to sit and sit there. But that's what was happening for decades. Listen, I, I, I think I, I agree think, with I, I think bail reform is a good thing when it comes to people that are not a danger to the community being let out. I, I, I think, unabashedly say that. Excuse I, me. I, no, that's that. all right. I, th I think we're all kind of in agreement, actually. But, you know, when we talk about reform, and you look at where the state's attorney's office sits, real reform has to happen over here with our failed social programs. Because for 30, 40 years, we've had failed social programs that end up with folks going into the criminal justice system, right? The real reform is to keep people out of the criminal justice system. On the back end, the reform is to take people that are in prison and have programs in our state prison system that don't teach them how to be better criminals, but teach them how, when they get out, not to be a repeat offender. That's where you can really have real reform. Within the state's attorney's office, yes, we need reform on, on bail. We need reform on not criminalizing poverty. But we have to hold people accountable, and the question is, how do you hold them accountable? What kinds of solutions can you find for a low-level nonviolent offender that don't involve prison? So we can get people back to work and not back into our justice system. But we're sandwiched. And we have to be, as state's attorney, you have to be an activist, both in terms of social programs that aren't working and why we're getting kids into the criminal justice system and advocate to our state representatives to make our prisons better so we're not so we're not teaching them how to commit a better crime. I, I am so glad that she says uh, what I've been saying for years. And what we need well, education. Uh, yes, but you know what? I was an elected official, and that's why I provided jo uh, job fairs for veterans, ex-offenders, uh, for people in my community. We hired 8,000 people. I, I just recently gave a graduation at uh, uh, a recovery center on 35 graduates. I talk about, uh, and I talk to ex-offenders on a, a regular basis. I've given graduation speeches often at places on this. We need to find a way, and yes, the state's attorney can be an advocate. I said it the other night. I was in Park Forest, as a matter of fact, looking at a program where we use our junior colleges to rehab uh, uh, homes that are going in disrepair. At the same time, we ought to be doing that with the trades. Way back in 06, that long ago, Donna, I said that yes, uh, there should be, uh, not everybody should go to college, not everybody should own a home, but the pathway should so be there for everybody. Back to the state attorney, Grace. Um, the issue of ending no, uh, ending cash bail. Um, it's, it's been done in a couple of other states, a couple of jurisdictions, and uh, it's been advocated. 
It sounds to me like all four of you are sort of uh, inclined along those lines, but but I'm not sure you all really agree among each other. Can you, can you tell me what your position is on ending cash bail, and then we'll see how that compares to theirs. <laughs> Yeah, the cash bail system doesn't work. And I think that there's been a perversion of that system to have people believe that that's what is keeping people safer. If you are a threat to public safety, you should not be able to pay your way out of jail. Um, and, and that's what's happened. People who are involved, for example, in gang activity who know, hey, if they give me 50000 or or $100,000, they've got $10,000 that someone will bring them. If you are a threat to public safety, then you should not be in the public. You sh there should not be a monetary attachment to that. And that's what cash bail does. So the standard for bail should be what? Making sure you come back? The standard for bail is it's actually written. It's constitutional. It's it's are you a flight risk or are you a danger are to the public? Risk? Yeah, those are the two main criteria. Are you going to return and are you a danger to the public? Okay. And cash is not an indicator so, of either. So rather than just, do you all agree with, with uh, do you all agree <coughs> with what Kim said? Or is, there, is she, how would you phrase it? Well, and, and listen, there are constitutional rights that you have for bail. I do agree that uh, the two major considerations are flight risk and safety to the community. I think the devil is in the details. So you get somebody in on a burglary. I don't know how people are going to classify as burglary a violent crime or not, but are, are you a danger to the community or not? But let's say the person who commits the burglary has three armed robbery convictions, an attempt murder conviction, and um, a couple of, you know, um, uh, nollies, uh, dismissals on other violent crimes. That's the tougher call. Sure. And that's the call where you have to use your discretion as a prosecutor and, and, and try to make the determination as to what you're going to advocate to the judge in that case. But the issue isn't money. The issue, and I, to be clear, I agree yeah. that that is a call that you have to look at the totality, not just the charge. But what's happening is saying, well, I'll give him a $200,000 bond versus he doesn't deserve a bond because his record would indicate that he's a threat. And that's what we're talking about in the cash bail well, is well, the money first of piece. All, uh, every, as I said earlier, every case is to be judged on the merits, on who's before the court. Uh, again, I'm going to go back to what happened at the so 1200 block. Yeah, to that question there, Bob. So what's your position on eliminating cash? It depends. It will I depend. Mean, are we, are we, I mean, should, are is it a first-time offender? Are there many people now being held in jail for whom we should eliminate cash bail? Uh, there are some. But I, I, a first-time offender, you know, and whether they're a flight risk, whether they're a... Uh, uh, violence involved? That's the question. You can't, we, uh, you know, you're, uh, the broad based question that you're asking is so broad. And, and we can take these hypotheticals, mm -hmm. but there are realistic uh, issues out there, again, on this party scene that happened on the four people arrested. Uh, if they, here they are, reg, uh, they've been a, a, a list of felony convictions on each and every one of them. I mean, we have to take a look at what we're putting back out in our communities. So, Bob, are you saying they should pay the out or, door, or stay in? That's the question. Should they, they be able to pay through, or if, stay? If there are multiple felony, uh, and depending on what kind of uh, felonies that they were convicted of or pled to, then we've got to take a look at what's going to happen. I, 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 I've said the example of the grandmother who gave the kid at Urban Prep uh, a gun to travel with. And there he was arrested for illegal possession of a gun. What are we going to do with that kid? You know what? Uh, he's he's a sort of example that prob that no bail would be applicable to. That's a real example. I'm, I, the, I'm not making up hypotheticals on how. We, but again, we have to look at each and every case individually. Yeah. No. I. I, I I am for ending cash bail. It does not make sense if somebody who has money can bond out of jail for the same, at the same rate when somebody who doesn't have money can't. That's not fair. That's not right. Uh, but I do want to make sure that when we start looking at how we're going to end cash bail, that, uh, that some of the charges in the Bail Reform Act that are discretionary, no bail, like criminal sexual assault and, um, and armed habitual criminal, for example, will fall into that category that those type of people should be held. So I think that, that is, um, that's just something we have to make sure that we get right so that we're keeping dangerous folks that are in, but people that aren't a danger to the community are not right. kept in jail. Because Cook County Jail 
is a terrible place. So much worse than the Illinois Department of Corrections, having, having visited both of those as a, as a visitor. Um, and we don't want to be sending people there that we don't have to. So, Donna, you're yeah. uh, for ending cash bail? or You said the devil was in the details, so yeah. I wasn't clear on whether you... Well, or for it or, or against or which way you lean. Yeah. I, I, I lean towards ending cash bail, okay. but you have to take into consideration the criminal history of yeah. the person right. you're dealing right. with. Right. Right. Okay. We've only got three minutes left. Okay. Seventy five minutes has gone by in a hard time. <laughs> Seventy five minutes. So why don't we allow ask each of you to just give us sort of a closing point and anything you'd like to do? And we'll start with Bill. You know, you know, one thing that I, I wish we spent more time in these sessions talking about is how we would change the organization of the office. You know, I had, I had a wonderful time in that office because I went from misdemeanor crime uh, for 18 months and then traffic for, for a year, and then, uh, you know, special prosecutions for three and a half years where I got to do a whole myriad of things. And because of that, you know, I wrote a couple appeals. What I think is gonna be important in that office is that we need to start moving people around a little bit more. You know, when you start in that office, you, you're in the same assignment for about a year and a half. Then you go to your second assignment for three years, you know, then uh, felony review and prelims, et cetera. And you get up to the trial division. You've been in the office seven years and you've, in a lot of cases, never seen a case. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be important to give people a multivariate experience so that when they do get to the trial division, they have... Uh, you know, know how to read a driver's abstract, know how to conduct a bond hearing, can pick up a gun case and try it that afternoon. I think these are important things. Now, I do want to say there are some unique situations like domestic violence, you need to keep the same people there because it has a unique um, skill set. Or, uh, you know, sex assault cases and murder cases you need to stay with the same people. But in the office, I want to be moving around people more so that people are getting a multivariate experience so that when someone's trying a case, hey, they've written an appeal before so they can be mindful of what the issues that may come up so they can do other things. But it's maybe a longer discussion. Bob, your final thoughts? Well, as I listen to what has been said here before, uh, you know, it's easy to uh, move people around, but it's on the training, it's on the morale. I believe the morale of the, of the state's attorney's office currently is uh, very low uh, because they don't have clear direction. But at the same time, uh, we need to have an office that is responsive to the community, uh, making sure that our, and the community includes everybody, uh, over 200 police uh, departments here in this county. Uh, we have to react uh, with and interact with people from all walks of life. And, uh, you know, we can talk about all kinds of changes, but the one thing that we should remember, the, the state's attorney's office is not just uh, an entity that deals with uh, the, the criminal code and the traffic code. It deals with uh, thousands of and hundreds of lawsuits that are in the civil section. We, you know, Bill briefly fair. touched upon the appeal. Well, look at where we are with our appeal process in the state's attorney's office right now. We didn't touch upon that. That's keeping people back who probably rightfully should be out of jail right now. We need to uh, dedicate the resources towards our appeal process and, and find ways to move these cases in the appellate. Writing an appeal is no easy task. And I, I can guarantee a lot of attorneys are not up for it, and even those in the state's attorney's office. So we need to find the right kind of people. So, yeah. yes, it is. Sure. I was a supervisor in appeals. Um, this race, this is the race for the top prosecutor. It should be about fairness and justice. It shouldn't be about politics and money. I'm not tied to a political machine. I'm not tied to a billionaire's ATM. I am independent. And I will uphold the law without fear or favor. Because this office, you need to make decisions on the law and not on politics. People are crying out for a change. We had a huge change in the mayor's race, as you know, in, in uh, Chicago. People want change. They don't want the same old, same old. They want a lawyer who will actually represent them and be an advocate for them. And that is what I will do as Cook County State's Attorney. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You know, when I ran for this office in 2016, I ran on a platform that would be uh, fundamentally different than how this office was run. Uh, recognizing the racial inequities in our justice system, recognizing the brokenness of a system that left so many people 
in neighborhoods that have been impacted by violence um, unwilling or reluctant to work with us. I said that I was going to take a more holistic approach to this work. And the fact of the matter is, is that I, I don't believe that you sit and wait for someone else to do it, that you have to lead on these efforts. And that's what I've done. Um, the efforts that we've led on criminal justice reform uh, are fundamental, I believe, to public safety. And whether that is on the marijuana legislation, which is historic, that will give across the state, hundreds of thousands of people, the ability to participate in our economy legally. Uh, that is, you know, that helps us with public safety. When people can work, they are less apt to go out and commit crimes to provide for their families. Whether that was stopping the criminalization of poverty for people driving on suspended licenses or being innovative in our approach of having our office in the communities that have been impacted by violence. It is of no surprise that when I look at the Democratic nominees who are running for president, that each and every one of them have a criminal justice platform that mirrors what we've already accomplished here. I think this office is absolutely important that we make sure that our communities are safe and, pro and protected, but that we're also innovative and thoughtful and mindful of the people for whom we serve that we don't parachute into neighborhoods and talk about militarization and over-policing in places where people feel like that's what's caused the destruction of their communities, that we believe in their ability to, to, to grow and thrive. It's why I talk about coming from Cabrini, because I know in every neighborhood where a child is dying that we're losing the potential. If someone had imagined that I would be the first black woman to serve in this role from Cabrini, um, They'd have thought they were crazy, but that's what happens in Roseland, in Lawndale, in Austin, when we're losing people every day. And so it's been an honor and a privilege to serve in this role. I, I have taken the knocks and owned that we've not been perfect, but I do know that we have a much better state's attorney's office and justice system here in Cook County that has gone from one of uh, ridicule to one that is a model for the nation. And for that, I'm very proud. Thanks to all four of you. Thank you. Thanks for, thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely.